want to welcome everybody here today. Thank you for being with us. If you're new, thank you for your presence with us today. Welcome to our online church family. We're so glad that you are here today. I, uh, I want to ask you something real quick. Have you ever done something dangerous? I don't see any hands. Anybody done anything dangerous before? Now, I know some of you might raise your hand and say, I've done something stupid. But sometimes stupid can be dangerous, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I want to talk to you today about something that we can do that's dangerous, but I want to challenge you to do it. Uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 9. Uh, if you've been around Grace for a little while, you've heard me say this, uh, and, and it's probably more repeated in my head than it is stuck in yours, but something that I say frequently is, Jesus was on mission. Jesus was on mission. When he came to earth, he came with a purpose, a purpose that continues today. He came to fulfill God's plan. He lived his life with intentionality to do the will and the work of the Father. And Jesus never allowed himself to be sidetracked from what God had called him to do. He was on mission. I believe that our Heavenly Father has a purpose and plan for our lives. And when we live out the purpose and plan that he has for us, we find ourselves on mission like Jesus. And Jesus helps us to know the mission that God has for us. We find that Jesus in the Gospels is always taking the disciples with him. And, and you might wonder, why did he do that? Well, he wanted them to understand what he was doing and why. Because his mission would soon be their mission. And their mission would soon be passed on, which was his mission. The work that Jesus did, they did. And it would be passed on to us today. So Jesus' mission is our mission. What Jesus came to do in many ways is what we are to do. And we see Jesus living out his mission in the verses we look at today. In Matthew 9.35, it says this, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and he healing every disease and sickness. And, and I want you to notice the first two words there. It says, Jesus went. Those may not seem like very big words or very important words, but I want you to know they are words that have profound implications for our life. Because it doesn't say, Jesus waited. It says, Jesus went. Jesus went to the people. He did not wait for the people to come to him. What is the implications for us as a church? What is the implication for us as believers in Jesus? I, I, I want us to be honest for just a moment as a church and as believers in Jesus. What we tend to do is wait for people to come to us. Isn't that right? Hey, if they want to know about Jesus, if they want to learn more about him, if they want to get to know Jesus, if they want someone to explain things about the Bible, we are right here waiting for them. They can come to us. And there was a time in America where that perhaps worked out well, but I don't know if you've noticed or not, but America today isn't like it was. And what worked back then doesn't work now. Here's the beautiful thing. Jesus did not wait for people to come to him. Jesus went to the people. He was on mission. He was sent by the Father. He was sent, so He went. If we really want to connect people to the good news of God's kingdom, if we want to connect them to Jesus, we can't sit here and wait. We have to go. We have to share the gospel. We have to go where people are. And listen, if you are a believer in Jesus, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you are a disciple of Jesus, you have been sent. Jesus said in John 20, verse 21, this is after the resurrection, He appeared to His disciples and He said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent Me, I am, what? Sending you. In other, you know, 
we have stoplights in, in, for a reason, right? Stoplights are important. We know that red means you stop. Green means you go, right? And yellow means you hurry up through the stoplight, right? Isn't that what that means? Yes. I, that, that's how I usually interpret it. But, it, you know, we have stoplights. They give us instruction. They let us know what to do. Listen, Jesus has given us the green light to go into the world and to make disciples. The question is, as church, as believers, are we sitting idly by when the light is green or are we going? (laughs) If you have ever sat at a stoplight, you're in a hurry to get somewhere and it's red light. You're just sitting there just waiting for that light to change, right? And then the light changes, but the person in front of you isn't paying attention. The light, yeah, exactly, exactly. The light is green and you're sitting there waiting and they're just sitting there idling. They're not going. My friends, we have been called beloved church family. We have the green light and let it be said of us that we went because Jesus sent us to go. Let's be intentional about sharing the good news, the gospel of the kingdom with others. Amen? In Matthew 9, 36, it continues and it says, when he, Jesus, when Jesus saw the crowds, I want to stop here for a moment because this is, this is important. Jesus saw the crowds, went out to meet them and he saw the crowds. He saw the sea of humanity that was in front of him. What did he see? Well, we know he saw people that were sick, that were not doing well. They needed help. They needed healing. And, and, and the question as I was studying this that struck me was this. What do we see when we see people? What do we see when we see the sea of humanity? What do we see when we see people in our culture? And I want us to be honest for just a moment about what we see and our thoughts about it. And, And I'm going to just be fair because I'll answer the question. I'll answer sometimes what I see, okay? Uh, And, uh, I look at our culture today, I look at the sea of humanity today, and I quite often find myself shaking my head in disbelief. Anybody? You know, there are thankfully moments where something impacts us as a people, and we find ourselves dropping into our knees in prayer, like what happened with Damar Hamlin, and praise the Lord that he has recovered. And what was strange was that a nation that often scoffed at the idea of prayer, suddenly found themselves praying. It made a difference in DeMar's life. Will it make a difference in ours? I look at this sea of humanity, and it seems that truth is lost. Love is gone. Reality is warped. Sin is rampant. Understanding is dumbed down. Leadership is lacking. We have lying politicians, and we have self-serving religious leaders. Right is wrong. Wrong is celebrated. Brokenness is everywhere. Hope is gone. Confusion abounds. It seems that we have a moral compass without a true north, that our moral compass is wherever we set it. It's like we are mortally wounded and incapable of being healed. Our solutions lead us deeper into despair. Our wisdom fails us. Listen, we're at a time in our society and culture, and I'm not casting stones. I'm just making an observance, okay? We don't even know now what a man and a woman is. We have family-friendly drag shows. Someone will show us a picture of a a circle and tell us it's a square. How do we respond to this? How do we respond to what we see? Do Do we think, oh, idiots, morons, you're getting what you deserve. Are we judgmental? Are we condemning? Do we feel a sense of superiority because we're morally better and so we have a sense of self righteousness? If we are not careful when we look at the sea of humanity, we will respond wrongly. We will see the symptoms rather than the root problem. We will focus on 
the symptoms. We will attack the symptoms rather than help to bring healing to the real issue, the real problem. What are symptoms supposed to do? If you have symptoms and you go to the doctor, what do they do? The symptoms help the doctor to figure out what's wrong. Because, listen, you don't want someone to just treat the symptoms. You want them to cure you, right? Wouldn't it be nice if we could get a cure for the common cold? All we can do is treat the symptoms because they don't know how to cure the common cold. But that's what symptoms are for, to point us to what's the real problem so we can identify it and be healed. And if we want to look at society and if we want to do what Jesus did, we need to listen to what it says he did in Matthew 9, 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. What did Jesus see in humanity, the sea of humanity? He saw sheep without a shepherd, sheep who were harassed and helpless. I, I don't know if you've ever seen a dog get a toy, but he takes it and he grabs a hold of that thing and he's like, and he's shaking it and everything everywhere. Anybody ever seen the dog do that? Well, harassed means to skin, to flay, to lacerate. Helpless means to be cast aside, to throw aside, or to hurl. It is the image of sheep at the mercy of wolves. And how many know that wolves have no mercy for sheep? You won't find one wolf that has mercy on sheep. Donald A. Hagner in the Word Biblical Commentary for Matthew says this. He says, what causes Jesus deep compassion at this point? Please don't miss this. What causes Jesus deep compassion at this point is not the abundance of sickness that he has seen, even though that bothers him, but rather it's the great spiritual need of the people. It was the great spiritual need of the people that caused him to respond with compassion. People whose lives have no center, whose existence seems aimless, whose experience is futility. And listen to what he says. The whole gospel is a response to this universal human need. And doesn't this precisely describe what is happening in our culture today, in our world? People are harassed. They are helpless. They are like sheep without a shepherd. They are living their lives with this great spiritual need, not having any center in their lives. They have what would be called an aimless existence, and the experience of their life is that life is futile. What would happen if we began to see people the way that Jesus sees people? What if we see people as sheep at the mercy of wolves seeking to rip and tear them apart? Because this, this is what's happening. If we're going to do what Jesus did, we have to see what Jesus sees. And when we see what Jesus sees, we will respond like Jesus responded. And how did he respond? He had compassion on them. Compassion. Wolves have no mercy for sheep. I've met some, I've met some Christians who often lack mercy. I've been a Christian who's often lacked mercy. And I bet you have too. Jesus never lacked mercy for people. He had a heart of compassion for them. He had compassion on them. Have you ever had something that impacted you so that it just wrenched your gut? And when I say that, listen to what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about you had a trip to Taco Bell and then you had to make a run for the border. I'm talking about something that, that really, I mean, it, it, I, I remember, and I shared this story with the church uh, the story about, I think it was a five or a six-year-old boy who was, who was abused, beaten, neglected, and it was, it was, I think it was over in, in Britain or somewhere. And see, uh, closed-circuit television, they had cameras set up to keep an eye on him. And there was one scene where he's in there and he's just screaming, why won't somebody love me? And I read that and it just, it, it did something to me. 
It was, it was gut-wrenching. Maybe you've seen something that was gut-wrenching. You heard something that was gut-wrenching. Someone told you something, and it was gut-wrenching. You felt it deep. You experienced it in your gut. This was Jesus' response to what he saw in the crowds. He was wrenched in the gut. And compassion, understand this, compassion is a gut reaction. The word compassion in the Greek literally describes the bowels and the kidneys. So when it says Jesus had compassion, it's describing a gut reaction to what he saw. And compassion, something beautiful, this is one of the most beautiful things about Jesus. He is compassionate. And as H. Koster said, compassion is always used to describe the attitude of Jesus and it characterizes the divine nature of His acts. What does genuine compassion do? It will move you to action because you can't sit idly by. You have to do something to what you see. And if you don't do action and you say you have compassion, what you have is a form of pity. You have a form of sentimental, emotional feeling. But if it doesn't lead to action, it's not genuine compassion. Jesus saw the people in this horrible spiritual state. And he makes this sobering statement. Now remember, we're talking about something dangerous to do. We're getting there, okay? Jesus said to the disciples, he's looking at the sea of humanity, and he says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And I thought about this. I'm like, why did Jesus do that? Why did he at this moment point out that there's a plentiful harvest, but there are only a few workers? Why did he direct his disciples to ask? And the word there is a a command. It's in the imperative. Ask. He's saying to them, pray. You pray and you ask the Lord of the harvest. Jesus is the Lord of the harvest. You ask the Lord of the harvest. You pray and you ask Him to send workers out into the field because the harvest is plentiful. I mean, that's kind of a strange prayer, isn't it? Why am I asking Jesus, the Lord of the harvest, who knows that the, the, the harvest is plentiful and the labors are few, why do I need to ask Him to send out workers when He already knows there's a need for workers? Isn't that kind of strange? Why, why, why would Jesus do that? If you've ever done a harvest, anybody done any planning and harvesting? A few people? Yeah. One of the things you know is this, that, that when the harvest comes, you've got to deal with the harvest right away, right? It's because it's ripe. It's ready. And if you don't go and get it, what is ripe will eventually become rotten. What is ripe will eventually fall to the ground and be spoiled. And so there is a need when there is a harvest. There is an urgent need when there is a harvest. And Jesus here isn't speaking about fruit or vegetables. He is talking about people who are created in the image of God that God loves. In John 4, we find Jesus in Samaria. Y'all with me this morning? He was in Samaria with his disciples, which was an inconvenient place to stop if you were a Jew. If you were a good Jew, you went of your way to avoid Samaria. Yet the scripture says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. His disciples were with him. And as Jesus was there, he met a woman at the well. Most of you probably already know the story. He has a conversation with her. It changes and transforms her life. And she's so excited about her meeting with Jesus that she runs into the town that she's from and she tells everybody, you have got to come see this man. He told me everything I ever did. Could he be the Messiah? And everybody in the town is stirred up and they come out to meet Jesus where he met her. And as Jesus is standing there with his disciples, seeing the sea of humanity coming towards him, listen to what he says. Do you not say four more months and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Jesus said, open your eyes. Would you say that? Open your eyes. Open your eyes. Now, this is part of our prayer focus for 2023, right? 
We're praying that God will open our eyes so that we will know the hope to which we are called, that we will know that we are God's glorious inheritance, and that we will know His power which is for us. But Jesus is giving something else that He's desiring that our eyes will open to, and that is to the harvest of people that God loves. And He's calling His disciples, which is an important thing to remember as we are celebrating Martin Luther King Day tomorrow, that we need to set aside our prejudices, our angers, the experiences that we have, the dislike that we have for other people, so that we can see what Jesus sees. And what Jesus sees is people who are lost, spiritually hungry, who need mercy, who need compassion, who need to know the God that loves them and created them. And He's calling His disciples. He is calling His church Open your eyes and see what I see. Do we see the need? Do we have this sense of urgency that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few? See, here's, I think, why Jesus told them to pray. See, Jesus already knows that laborers are needed. He he already knows that, but we don't. And so he gets us to pray. Because if we really pray that prayer, God, I see the need and I see the labor of the harvest and it's plentiful. And I see that the labors are few. See, what you're not going to do is you're not going to pray that prayer and, and not change. You're not going to pray that prayer and do nothing. Oh, yeah, I see sheep without a shepherd. That's horrible, isn't it? Hey, try to avoid the wolves. They'll tear you apart. Go on and be in peace. You can't do that when you really pray this prayer. When we take to heart this prayer and we take to heart what Jesus says and our eyes are open to see what Jesus sees, it's going to do something to us. And suddenly we're not just going to be praying a prayer. We're going to find ourselves saying, God, send out laborers, but don't just send out laborers because I see what you see and your compassion has filled my heart and I can't sit here idly by and do nothing. I've got to go. So Jesus, here I am I. You send me and let me go and labor for you. See, and, and, and understand what I'm going to say. We, we, we become the answer to our prayer But we're the answer to our prayer because Jesus got us to pray so that we would see what He sees. We would have His heart. We would have His eyes. We would have the compassion that He has. We would see the spiritual need and it would move us to do something and to be on mission with Him. Hmm. If you want to do something that is of eternal significance and worth, you do what Jesus did. And, you know, the proof of this is found in chapter 10. Right after the end of chapter 9 here, you go to chapter 10, guess what happens? Jesus sends out the disciples to do what he did. That's why he had them pray that prayer. So it would become real. His mission would become real to them. Send out workers. Send out workers. This is a dangerous prayer. This is the dangerous thing that I'm asking you to do. This is a dangerous prayer if you pray it. Because if you pray it and sincerely mean it, it will change and transform you. The word send out literally means to cast out, to throw out, to drive out. Understand what you're asking Jesus to do. You're you're asking Him to move you from your place of comfort, your zone of comfort, you're, you know, you're where you are comfortable. And when you pray, Lord, send out laborers into the harvest because the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. When you pray that, you're asking God to, to give you a kick in the rear. If I put it in just modern English, that's what you're asking him to do. You're, you're asking him to, to, to push you out the door. Like you have to do sometimes when your kids don't want to go to school. you got to push them out the door and say, you're going, bye, right? It reminds me of of when a baby bird has it easy in the nest. Mom and dad do everything. Mom and dad bird do everything for that baby bird. They feed it. They keep it warm. They protect it. Life is good in the nest. 
But somewhere along the line, the nest becomes a place of comfort and the bird either has to get up and fly or it gets kicked out because it's time to fly. In football, the coach calls your name and you get off the bench. And the coach calls you over and he says, listen, you need to get out there on the field and do something. You need to get out there and make something happen. You need to get a tackle. You need to cause a fumble. You need to intercept something. You need to score a touchdown and run it in. So get out there and make something happen. And he pops you on the rear and you're out on the field in battle. My point is simply this. The reason this prayer is dangerous is because you're asking God to kick you out of your comfort zone to open your eyes to see what Jesus sees, to fill your heart with the compassion, Jesus. And listen, this is important. When you genuinely and sincerely pray this, what you see will break your heart. When you, we see what Jesus sees, it will break your heart. And it will burden your heart and say, this isn't right, it shouldn't be this way. I've got to do something about it. Lord, send laborers again. Here am I. Send me. I think of... I think of uh, my in-laws, Joe and Elsie Arthur. Was it... And they're here today. David, so glad to have them here with us. Was it 65? 65, they... <laughs> Joe and Elsie dragged three little boys to Africa leaving behind everything that they knew for a future that was unknown, going to a people and a culture that they didn't know, but going because God opened their eyes and they felt the call to go and labor in the harvest field. I think of David who is following in that tradition as, as a missionary, serving overseas, going, sharing in various parts of the world. I don't know if I should say, so I'm not going to say anything. And making a difference in God's kingdom. I think of Pastor Silvano and Andrea. A beautiful church at home. Family, friends, they have been a part of for so long. Their home, to come here in pursuit of God's call. Because they see the need. They see that the harvest is great, but that the laborers are few. And so they abandon everything to follow the call of God. What about us? See, you, you don't have to go overseas to go. You, you don't have to go to Africa. You don't have to go to... Argentina, you don't have to go to China. I mean, if God calls you, by all means, go. You can just go across the street to your neighbor. You, you, you can go to the person that you run into when you're out doing activities that God brings into your path. You, you can go across from where your office space is to the other office space and connect. See, it, it's... It's, it's, don't wait, is what I'm saying. Go. It, it, it's not going overseas, it's going. And that's what, my friends, we are called to do. Amen? We are called to go. And I pray that we will hear that call of the Father, that we will pray this dangerous prayer. Send out laborers, Lord, because the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And find ourselves praying the very prayer that Jesus said. And so I, I do want to pray a prayer for us today. And I'm not going to close our eyes. I'm not going to close my eyes. It's written, so I have to look down. But uh, if this is your prayer, if, you're, if God is speaking, if the Spirit of God is stirring you today, and you're saying, yeah, I'm tired of sitting and I want to go, then then would you just agree with me in prayer today? You don't have to pray what I'm praying, but you can sit there and go, yes, God, amen, make it so in my life. Heavenly Father, light a fire in us. Light a fire under us. Kick us out of the nest. Kick us out of our comfort zone. 
Get us up off the bench and onto the field. Send us out to make a difference for you. The harvest is great. The laborers are few. And there is much work to be done. Here am I. Send me. Help us to see what you see in people. Burden our hearts with what burdens yours. Fill our hearts with your compassion and empower us by your Spirit to bring in the harvest for your kingdom. Jesus, we want to see what you see so that we will do what you do. You are on mission. And we want to be on mission with you as your disciples. Amen? Amen. And here's the thing, and I'm closing. Sorry, it's a little bit longer than normal today, but what a beautiful day. When we get on mission, I believe this is true, and we see this play out throughout the New Testament. When we do what Jesus did, God God often shows up in miraculous ways. You may be surprised what God does in you and through you when you get on mission with Him. Father, I thank You for this beautiful crowd. I thank You for the call of Jesus. I thank You for the compassion that He has on people. And Father, it's so easy for us to get our eyes on the symptom rather than recognize the real problem. It's a spiritual problem, and people need you. May our eyes be open to see what you see, Jesus. May our hearts be filled with compassion, and when we pray that prayer to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers, may we be the first to respond, God, here I am. Send me, use me. I want to go. And I want to be a part of what you are doing. And Father, for Grace, for Grace Hispanic, for our churches, our church, your church, may we see the harvest brought in for your glory and your honor. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Please continue.